Hey everybody, welcome back to another week on the Damage Report. I'm Johnny Rolla and Brooke Thomas is here. I am here. Uh, here. Lost a couple band aids. I broke three nails this weekend. What moving, have you been up to? Things. So oh, I feel moving. like I need okay. to just like announce that okay. this is why this is what we're working with. It's just uh, yeah, yeah. You didn't uh-huh. like have to get out of like a well you'd fallen Mm-mm. into or just anything. Just carrying boxes and stuff. <laughs> okay, no, you know. no wells. <laughs> um, and you're all moved in. I am all moved in. Mm-hmm. I am not totally unpacked or mm-hmm. totally organized. I'm actually totally unpacked, not totally organized. Mm-hmm. But I am here to stay. Okay. 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 Uh, by the way, uh, one of the missions that I have for this show on Mondays is to learn more about Brooke. <gasps> so this is a small thing, but do you prefer to live uh-huh. alone or with roommates? Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh huh. You can think about it if you want. Okay. No, you know what? <laughs> I think there are benefits with both. I don't think I have like a pr- preference. I like living alone. Mm-hmm. I also like the money that I'm saving right now. Mm-hmm. I don't really like my roommates. Okay. Um, I just said that on TV. Yeah, no, it's TV <laughs> and it's gonna be out there. So enjoy going home today. It's gonna be drumming their fingers on the tail. Anyway, uh, or table. Um, okay, well, look, we've got more information about her preferred living situation. We also <laughs> have ask news. Ask a better question, um, think about no, it. No, I won't. It'll <laughs> I be worse. No. We're gonna be talking a lot about some of the fallout of the weekend over the na- national emergency declaration that Donald Trump totally decided to do that he totally didn't need to do. We're right. gonna have some of the attempts by his supporters to defend that decision, and we're gonna rate how effective they actually were. Um, I apologize, but the president is threatening to potentially lock people up again, and we're gonna have an interesting little game in the middle of the show. Uh, who does he wanna lock up more, Robert Mueller or Alec Baldwin? We're gonna look at the evidence <laughs> and uh, make our evaluation a little bit later on. Uh, we also have two awesome guests are gonna be joining us. So in the second half of the show, Paul Ehrlich is gonna be joining us, uh, author, scientist, and he's going to be responding to some of the recent reporting around uh, plummeting insect populations around the world. Uh, is that good news or bad news for us? Bad news, and he's gonna describe all the ways why. And we also have, once again, joining us on the show, Amar Kempanajar is gonna be pursuing the Democratic nomination for the 50th Congressional District in California, going up against Duncan Hunter, one of the worst people in Congress right now. So we're gonna be talking about that and more. So it should be a lot of fun. You you decided to beat my whole, you said it like on TV kind of thing. That was a better statement than mine. Oh, good. Ago. Okay. Appreciate that. Okay. Well, hopefully he'll be watching. <laughs> and with that, why don't we jump into it? Let's do it. Over the weekend, many of Donald Trump's supporters in the media and in Congress were out there defending his decision to totally for no reason and unnecessarily declare a national emergency so that he can get billions of dollars in funding for a wall that even his own party didn't really seem to care about giving him during congressional negotiations. So we have Lindsey Graham, who once used to be a gigantic critic of Donald Trump, saying his election would be the death of the Republican Party and all that, now cannot find any space between them on any issue. So uh, what about the fact that some of this money, this military construction money was gonna be going to important uh, construction, either abroad or here in the US. What does he think about that? Construction of a middle school in Kentucky, housing for military families, improvements for bases like Camp Pendleton and Hanscom Air Force Base. Aren't you concerned that some of these projects that were part of uh, legislation that you helped approve in Congress are now going to possibly be cut out? Well, the president will have to make a decision where to get the money. Let's just say for a moment that he took some money out of the military construction budget. I would say it's better for the middle school kids in Kentucky to have a secure border. We'll get them the school they need. But right now, we got a national emergency on our hands. Opioid addiction is going through the roof in this country. Thousands of Americans died last year and dying this year because we can't control the flow of drugs into this country, and all of it's coming across the border. So Through the dangers of entry, presented by a broken to the, border to, to customs me, and border patrol, though. <clears throat> but both. It's both. It's not just one. For every for every one we get, God knows how much we miss. Yeah, technically that's possible. It is true that we can't know what we miss at the border. But that doesn't mean that you can necessarily allocate billions of dollars based on what we might be missing. We might be missing a thriving cross-border trade and illegal tiger deliveries. We don't know that, so we're not gonna necessarily break you know, legal precedent, constitutional precedent to allocate billions of dollars to stop those tigers from getting across the border. And he can't prove that they're not coming across the border. So look, we're gonna return to the school stuff in just a second. But I know we were, during during the video, we were talking about the opioid part of this. So one of the issues is the lies come so thick and so fast that you can't respond to all of them. So 
She responded to him saying that the drugs are coming across the border because we know that statistically 85% don't come randomly across the border, they come through ports of entry. But that isn't even the biggest issue with what he said, that's almost a diversion. The issue is that the deaths from drugs in the US are predominantly not from heroin coming across the border, it's from opioids that are manufactured here, they're People totally are legal. People to their doctor and giving prescriptions. Exactly, like, right, that's not coming through great. a port of entry yeah. or across the border, that's totally legal. So if you want to do something about that, build a wall around Merck or something around the other <laughs> pharma companies. So that seemed a little bit disingenuous. Or like support legislation that kind of tries to do something about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then uh, the bigger issue in terms of that particular video is that he is asked about why kids not, should not get an elementary school that they need, so that we can instead stick steel slats in the border for a couple hundred miles. And uh, look, that's a difficult question to respond to. I think that we can all agree. But he didn't flinch, he just said, yes, I think those kids would rather have a secure border than a elementary school education. Right, the right in a answer building anyway. to that. Maybe they can learn outside, I don't know. Yeah, the right answer to that question is, you know what? That That is stupid. Uh, let me, let me. Mm -hmm. Let me go back and, and, and fix this. Yep. That's that or, was the right answer. You're, you're good point. This is stupid. Or in <laughs> theory, he could have been like the issue with this. This what we just saw is he has to defend Donald Trump, but he he doesn't even seem to care about defending himself at this point. You could have said, you know what? That's a great point. There are a lot of projects that need military construction funds, and while we think that the border desperately needs it, we don't want those other ones to fall by the wayside. So while we are allocating this money, we will also be pushing for new appropriations for those projects. Right. But he's not doing that. It's just unthinking defense of the president. He says we need the border wall, I guess we need the border wall. Either he really cares about the border wall in a way that he hasn't for the rest of his career, or as many people believe, there's some other thing that's leading him to unflinchingly support the president in a way that he never used to. Anyway, there, he was not the only defender. Uh, defending uh, Donald Trump's emergency declaration we had on with Chris Wallace, uh, Stephen Miller. And so look, Stephen Miller is apparently one of the most xenophobic people in our country. He was brought into the White House specifically to push for an end to immigration. Not undocumented immigration, illegal immigration, just all immigration. He has been pushing for that in a number of different ways. So he of course defends the president declaring a national emergency over what's happening at the border. But he also wants you to believe that what Donald Trump is doing is just standard run of the mill stuff. Uh, unfortunately, he went on with uh, Chris Wallace on Fox News and Chris Wallace was willing to point out that this is a sort of ahistoric take. National emergencies have been declared 59 times right. since 1976 when the law was passed, the National Emergencies Act. Can you point to a single instance, even one, where the president asked Congress for money, Congress refused to give him that money, and the president then invoked national emergency powers to get the money. So first of all, can you find out one case? You think that what you're missing, Chris, is that the national emergencies don't all have the same authorities and the same justification. I understand that, but there have been 59. This, this, can you find authority, one case like this that? This authority specifically refers to the use of military construction funds. Other emergencies, for example, were declared well, to wait, wait, wait. I mean, if you want to talk about military, military, if you want to talk about military constructions, do you know how many times military construction has been invoked as a national emergency? That one was in twice. Right. Twice. Once by George H.W. Bush during the middle of the Gulf War, and the second time by George W. Bush right after 9-11. This name, is hardly comparable to either name, of those. Can you name one foreign threat in the world today outside this country's borders? that currently kills more Americans than the threats crossing our southern border? You know, the, the, the joy of this is I get to ask you questions, you the don't answer get to ask no, me. The answer is no. But the, oh, then, then answer can. my question. Can you name one case where a president has asked Congress for money, Congress has refused, and the president has then invoked national powers to get the money anyway? Well, this current situation- Just yes or no, sir. Okay, so uh, obviously that was a long video. We generally don't play videos that are that long. The reason we did it was we wanted you to know that he was never going to actually respond right. to that question. And he didn't, you, we could have gone on for a little bit longer. You never got an actual response from him. And it's important because they don't want you to believe that anything is happening out of the ordinary, but this is very much out of the ordinary. There are national emergencies, sure. There was Ebola under uh, you know Barack Obama, there was 9-11, but this is a voluntary thing and it has never been done as a result of a purely political calculation following a budget negotiation. 
There's 59 national emergencies stretching back literally decades under Democrats, under um, under Republicans, under unified government, under divided government. And they can't find one example where the will of Congress in the area where specifically the Constitution says that Congress is supreme. That is the distribution of funds where the president can simply say, you didn't give me what I want. Okay, and now Stephen Miller asked about that. Says uh, that this is legal because Congress passed a law for national emergencies back in the 70s, and that is true. But no law by itself overrides the Constitution. That is what the Supreme Court is set up to do: is to evaluate those discrepancies. So you can't simply say that Congress allowed it, and so we can do whatever we want. Right. Especially when later on he's asked about what if Congress overrides the national emergency declaration. He says, well, I mean, it's totally legal to do national emergencies, but in that law, it's says that they can be overridden. So he simultaneously wants to have his wall and eat it too on that. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't. So, um, I mean, look, we don't have much more time, but um, you've seen, we had Friday the National Emergency Declaration. Mm -hmm. You had a conversation over the weekend around it. How do you think that it's been received generally by, by both politicians and by the media? How, how is it playing? You know, shockingly for me, and um, there's so many things that I don't, I'm not shocked about and that I complain and people are shocked about. Mm -hmm. There's been so much support, I think I've seen. You think? From, like strong from his supporters. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, everyone was so, I feel like he started to lose momentum a little bit because of the shutdown. And now it's like, oh yeah, I get it this way. You're right, we're, we're, we're friends again. I don't mm -hmm. know, it's so, I, you would think that this would be something that would scare people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this is a slippery slope, we're not comfortable with this. You can't, you okay, you can't do that. Even if we want it, you can't do that, but this is, um, it's so it's been shocking for well, me. Well, to reassure you, at least outside this of politics, terrifying to everyone. Well, and I, I tried to make that case on Friday. Yeah. Uh, two thirds of uh, regular people did not want a national emergency to be declared, which means Trump's base was the ones who actually did support it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do think that the precedent is scary, both in terms of presidents continuing to accrue more power, obviously, but even the precedent for someone like Lindsey Graham and the other Republicans in Congress who are supporting this, they're saying, you know what? In the future, we don't want to have this ex exclusive power over the distribution of funds and, and budget and all of that. If the president wants it and if he disagrees with us, fine, he can just do this in the future. And will it be that difficult for a president to find some sort of grounds to declare a national emergency? Obviously, it will not be. Now, we do have to take a short break. When we come back, Amar Kampanajar is gonna be joining us talking about his upcoming congressional race in California and some issues surrounding that after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Joining us once again on the Damage Report, Congressional Candidate Amar Kampanajar. Amar, welcome back. How's it going? Happy to be back with you. It's good. Uh, happy to have you here, especially to talk about the uh, the launch of your your second run uh, for Congress. Uh, you were in California's 50th district, and in the last midterms, you uh, very narrowly lost to Duncan Hunter Jr., a guy with some uh, unique issues compared to other candidates. And uh, so you're going to be running again, correct? I'm running again. I actually kicked off one of my uh, offices yesterday. And we're just fired up and we're ready to go. And you know, we got 48.3%, which is really painfully close. And I have to give people perspective. I was running in a district that Hunter won by 27% last time. 
And to put 48.3% um, in context, Beto O'Rourke got 48.3%. And now the guy wants to run for president because he got so close in the Republican district. And I don't know what's going to happen with him, but I do know that I'm running again for Congress. And we're going to lead unapologetically with our values from the Green New Deal to Medicare for All to getting big money out of politics, even talking about term limits in the House to make sure we don't have the kind of corruption and dynasty that we're seeing with the Hunter family. So we're, we're firing at all cylinders, John. So I want to ask you a question. You, you prompted it with what you said there. Um, I know you, uh, all politicians are ambitious people considering what happened with Beto. Did, did you consider even briefly potentially running for president? I'm not, you know, the funny thing is when reporters ask me, uh, what do you think about the presidential election? My honest answer is I'm too young to run. I know they're not asking me about <laughs> me running, they're asking me who do I support. But I don't answer that question because I'm focusing on my race. And uh, first of all, I'm too young. Second of all, whoever is running for president, the full field isn't announced yet, needs to earn my vote the same way that I'm trying to earn my voters' votes in my district. Uh, good. And well, there's going to be a lot of people trying to do that. Uh, so let's talk about uh, what the, the, I guess, the environment might be for your, your second run. Um, the national conversation politically has changed quite a bit in just the past few months. Uh, as you brought up, uh, the Green New Deal is now one of the most talked about policies. There's uh, people questioning some of the orthodoxy in the Democratic Party on taxes. Um, do you think that if these policy policies that are being discussed and are likely to be discussed during the Democratic primary are sort of front and center, is that going to benefit your candidacy? I think so, because I think that where we're going to win is there has to be an electorate that we didn't tap into in 2018 that gets tapped into in 2020. And we all know people that will only vote, Democrats especially, who are stubborn, who no matter what's going on, will only vote when there's a presidential election and a presidential candidate on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if we hold that 48.3% and turn out those Democrats who only vote when there's a presidential election, and then those voters who feel like their voices haven't been heard, that all politicians are the same, no one's willing to have this bold, aggressive agenda to make sure that we preserve the only world we have, to make sure that healthcare is a right for all, not a privilege for a few, to make sure that people are not bought by special interests and can care for the interests of the people in our district, like. In my district, there's a lot of farmers who were hurt from the tariffs. They were hurt from the government shutdown. A lot of people who own property along the border, an eminent domain would actually take away people's private property for some compensation, but people actually care about their, their property that they own. So these issues that even conservatives in my district, if someone's willing to boldly speak to those issues and say, we're not gonna tolerate you know, these uh, government overreaches when it comes to the border, or we're not gonna allow um, insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies to rip us off completely while people languish and, and have literally only $400 or less in their bank account and can't afford one emergency if it were to happen. So I think speaking that way unapologetically, authentically, progressively is how we're gonna make up for that, that extra 3% that we lost the last time. And so while you're stressing those issues, that's the part of the, the campaign that you have control over. There are some other parts that you don't necessarily have control over, but might benefit from. And the first is that your likely opponent is facing dozens of indictments. Uh, try as I might, I was not actually able to find out what the current status of that is. Do you, do you have any knowledge about where in that process we actually are and potential legal ramifications for Duncan Hunter Jr.? Sure, yeah. Currently, he's innocent until proven guilty, which is the only like saving grace he had, which is why he got elected again. People just latched onto that notion that he was innocent until proven guilty. And some people in my district didn't know what a 60 count indictment was. It sounded like it was a speeding ticket or something. And people were thinking, if it's so bad, why is he still congressman? And that just speaks to the corruption in our system that we need to fix. Um, his court hearing is in September, and the deadline to be on the ballot is December. So I could see him conceivably uh, having his conviction drag out a couple months after his court hearing, mm -hmm. and him being the only guy left on the ballot on the Republican side, or the election taking place after the ballot's been ratified, and it's me and him, and then I win the primary, he wins the primary on his side, and I don't think people will vote for a convicted congressman. He's no longer innocent until proven guilty. So that's the most likely scenario, believe it or not. In this wonderful country of ours, we still could allow a convict to run for office and he can <laughs> serve. He may even win, I doubt it. But that's the kind of country that we have and it speaks to the corruption that, that exists in our system right now.
I, I hope that people would not vote for the convicted congressman. I, I do come from Bridgeport, Connecticut, where uh, our mayor stole hundreds of thousands of dollars, went to jail for nine years, got out, and is now mayor again. So fingers uh, crossed for the 50th yes. district. <laughs> um, I did want to. I just want people to know for sure the, the sort of guy that Duncan Hunter Jr. is, because not only is he facing all of these charges, but he somehow was able to largely escape any consequences for running during the last election. One of the most bigoted Islamophobic advertisements attacking you that I've seen. And I find it to be ironic because for the last week, we've been having this national discussion about religious bigotry in our elected officials. But he's just sitting there the whole time and people seem to have forgotten what exactly he did. Right, no, they have amnesia. And the thing is, look, I, I don't like parts of politics, right? Um, I consider myself to be a little bit independent in some ways. But uh, look, uh, our side, the Democrats, we do a good job at holding our own accountable when it comes to um, harassment, when it comes to corruption that's pretty explicit, like Hunter's situation, or Jesse Jackson Jr. when he had his situation, the same situation that Hunter's under now, or, or any type of other corruption or, or scandal. Hunter is being rewarded almost for, for having done what he went through. And he's saying, like, I'm like Trump. The, the DOJ is coming to attack me like Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's like almost a badge of honor now in the Republican Party, which is unfortunate. I mean, that's people cannot trust Hunter to do the day to day work. I mean, his, his district office is in disarray. He's not sitting in, on any congressional committees because he was stripped of them from his, his indictment. So he's not even a full time congressman. He was a bad one to start with. And he can't even deliver the basic services for our district. And I just think that regardless if you're a Republican, Democrat, or independent, you deserve a full-time congressman to do the full-time job and to be fully accountable. And right now we don't have accountability with them. And because of that, we're lacking opportunity in the district. And it's just a crying shame to see that happen because the people in my district are good people and they work hard and they have a congressman who's hardly working now, just fighting for yeah. himself. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I wish that we had more time. At some point, uh, I'd like to have you back on because I know we we spoke actually once right at the border wall. That is now going to be this big thing in this cycle. So hopefully, at some point, we can talk about how that might affect your race as well. Um, but Amar, thank you as always for coming on. We always appreciate it. Thanks for having me, John. Take care. Thanks. We're going to take a short break. Uh, when we come back, Donald Trump speaking out against the investigation against him. We'll talk about some of the possible implications of that after this. Prepare yourself. Okay. Donald Trump was on one this morning. Okay. He was huh? on one? Is that what you just said? Yes, That's he good. was. And we're going to break it down. Who does Donald Trump want to lock up more? Robert Mueller or Alec Baldwin? I'm honestly not sure at this point because he <laughs> lost his mind over both over the weekend. So, look, to some extent, this is going to be a little bit for fun, but there are some important implications here. So, let's start. It all began on a little show called Saturday Night Live, uh, S and L, according to Trump's ah, son. Yeah, that's and, awesome. Uh, yeah. And they did they did a thing about his national emergency declaration. They made fun of his ridiculous sing songy uh, legal proj projection uh -huh. and, and all of that. And uh, you know Donald Trump is an alpha male, as we keep getting told. So what does an alpha male do? He loses his s whenever anyone makes a joke about him and just goes crazy. So. He tweeted, nothing funny about tired Saturday Night Live on fake news NBC. Question is, how do the networks get away with these total Republican hit jobs without retribution? Likewise, for many other shows, very unfair and should be looked into. This is the real collusion, which will be very convincing to people who have no idea what that term means or anything surrounding it. So that's what he said. Now, he has previously attacked Alec Baldwin before. There, and like he's saying, there should be retribution. So that could mean a couple of different things, and I'm not sure which is actually better. Does that mean legal action against Saturday Night Live or Lorne Michaels or something for satirically making fun of politicians as they have done with every president for decades? Right. Most other Congress people and senators who get, you know, it's, I don't think Chuck Schumer is watching SNL and saying, I like that version of me that they're doing. Right. Yeah, I don't Nobody think a few people it. do. Um, or it could mean something else. And Alec Baldwin is at least implying that he has taken it in the other direction. Alec said, I wonder if a sitting president exhorting his followers that my role in a TV comedy qualifies me as an enemy of the people constitutes a threat to my safety and that of my family. Because look, I don't necessarily think that there's gonna be some sort of legal case against SNL, but we do know that he has millions of twisted followers, some of which might run across Alec Baldwin and wanna 
start something with him. And right. we know he got in a fist fight just a couple of months ago in New York. I mean, hey, that's a great point. It's absolutely, I mean, it's problematic. It's scary. I think that it, I don't know if it would constitute like a legal threat, but it definitely poses a, like, it, the, uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's a valid it's, threat, though. I, I for would sure, be worried. Think, just because of like what we know. Also, like, <laughs> just always go back to this is the same formula. They've had the same formula for years, mm-hmm. decades. Um, so that's not new. If you hate this so bad, mm-hmm. why did you host it so much? That's true. Why you know did you what host I mean? it? Like, why were you? Yeah. Uh, I would say follow up. Why did you watch it? Right. You don't have to. I you mean, don't have to. Watch and, for, it, and he right? always says that he doesn't. But of course, he did. He watched. Look it. at how good his like, like it. sleeping pattern, like on to like a regular <laughs> yeah. work schedule. If maybe like he wasn't up. That's true. Late enough to watch. Saturday he wouldn't Night have Live. to see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do. I don't often try to reassure the president. Right. But I will hear. So he also tweeted, "The rigged and corrupt media is the enemy of the people." In all caps. So. Again, I, I know everything's normalized. We keep saying that. A dude walked into a newsroom and shot up a bunch of, of reporters. Right. But once again, the president is in all caps saying that the media is, is your enemy. Um, SNL isn't the media. I'm just gonna say that. I mean, I know that you don't like other parts of the media. And I get that Michael Che and Colin Jost technically talk about the news, but they're not really the media. I think that you're sort of lumping things together there. But the question is, we know that he doesn't like Alec Baldwin and nothing gets under his skin like a person making fun of him, although possibly a woman making fun of him would be worse. Um, but he also said this, the Mueller investigation is totally conflicted, illegal and rigged, should never have been allowed to begin except for the collusion and many crimes committed by the Democrats. Witch hunt, so in the same sentence saying that it is a totally partisan witch hunt, he's saying there should have been one, but it should have been targeting the Dems. And so I just wanna briefly, again, just stop. I know everything's been normalized. The president is saying that the investigation into criminal wrongdoing in his campaign is illegal. Like people act like because something is said on Twitter, it doesn't matter, we shouldn't Wait. care. But that's the president saying that a totally legal, constitutionally set up, it was Congress set up this investigation, is illegal and nobody cares that that is what he's saying or the implications. So if this is an illegal investigation and they were to indict his son or himself, why would he follow that if it's illegal in the first place? Do we expect that he would actually abide by any sort of court proceedings that were to come from it? I don't think so. Right. I don't think so. I Am I freaking know. out you too got, much? I'm not no, sure. No, but I, I was like, wait, these are sarcastic things. This is these are rhetorical. Does he want? He doesn't really want an answer. I was just kind of like, oh, wait, maybe. You know. I don't know. I mean, I, I like to second guess no. myself as much as <laughs> no, the next guy, I suppose. Right. Completely uh, unbelievable. He also he retweeted a quote by Rush Limbaugh, proving that Rush Limbaugh does have at least one listener. Um, these guys, the investigators, <laughs> ought to be in today. jail. <laughs> Uh, what they have done working with the Obama intelligence agencies is simply unprecedented. It's not unprecedented. There have been special counsels a number of different times. Right. Uh, it's a gigantic it's a really, hoax. There's a really famous one, but it's fine. Yeah. So again, he's saying that not only is it illegal, but the people investigating him should be locked up. Right. I know that that's like a, a funny thing to say at a rally, you know, lock them up or whatever. Like, ah, there's a female politician. She should be in jail. But he's saying that Robert Mueller and the other investigators should be in jail right now. He also said that Andrew McCabe committed treason. So again, that's, treason is potentially a capital crime right. that you can be executed for. And the president is casually saying that everyone looking into his campaign should be in jail or possibly dead at this point. Part of his campaign though, of course, you, yeah, you mentioned like rallies was, no, he ran on the idea of putting his opponent in prison, and mm-hmm. then of course people were more mad that she didn't speak to him at a funeral. And yeah. um, <laughs> do you, do you, and so I, I think it's just sad that. Um, and then also he is willing to lock people up. He locked infants up, yeah, that's two true. year olds, four year olds. Like do, so, I, it should be. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's bizarre and sad that. Um, he says stuff like this, and people are like, "Ah, oh, it's just talk." Exactly. Yeah. You know, this is yeah, scary stuff. Your president should not be t- typing. Um, like so this. casually, right. yeah, yeah. And uh, I know that there's a lot of people that will say, don't pay attention to it, it's on Twitter. Or they'll say, well, he's attacked NBC before mm-hmm. and he didn't do anything, so why would you be worried about it? He's attacked Mueller before and he didn't do anything, why would you be worried about it? Well, I mean, things do sometimes change, I think we should acknowledge it. One, the dude just declared a national emergency that even he admits he didn't need to do, specifically so that he could get new powers for the presidency. So right, it seems so sort that? of significant. Right. Yeah. The uh, president actually very seriously wants 
a comedy, a t like television show investigated mm -hmm. because they hurt his feelings. A comedy show right. that did a, a sketch about a baking thing where someone uh, baked a live cake that wanted you to kill it because of the agony of its existence. Right. That's the media that he was wants investigated. But also, they have to make jokes half the time. They just have to repeat stuff he has actually been willing to say what out loud. Doing. That's it. Yes. It is. But also significantly, we're not in the same situation we were in a year ago, where Jeff Sessions was technically recused, whether he might have been, you know, getting involved. At least technically, was recused. Jeff Sessions has been pushed out by that same president, specifically because he was recused. And since then, he's been replaced by William Barr, a guy whose name is once again being used at the national level, only because he has spoken out against. The Mueller investigation. That's why he was plucked from the 90s and reinstalled as Attorney General. So the people who think you can never pay attention to anything that's happening, or ah, he would never actually be an authoritarian, he's gotten his lackey as AG. He's declared his national emergency. What more could he possibly do? Stay tuned, I guess. <laughs> okay, we do have to take a break, unfortunately. There's other problems going on internationally. Did you know we're running out of insects? We're gonna have a scientist on after this to break down some of the implications of new studies showing that insect populations are plummeting worldwide after this. Last week on The Damage Report, we talked about a new study showing that insect populations globally, a significant percentage of them, are either dwindling or endangered at this point, which was certainly scary news. And joining us now on the show to add some expertise to our commentary is a biologist and author, Paul Ehrlich. Paul, welcome to the show. Great pleasure to be here. I, actually, it's not a great pleasure because <laughs> we're true. all scared out of our minds. That's People, true. Um, you know, uh, who well, cares about insects? Well, I care about <laughs> insects because they are essential parts of our life support systems. If you like breathing and eating, you got to care about insects. Uh, and the the report was stunning in one sense, but those of us who've been involved in research in these areas for a long time are not surprised at all. In fact, if you're my age, you probably remember uh, that 50 or 60 years ago, if you drove around the eastern United States or even in the deserts, your car got coated with moths. Uh, there used to be so-called moth snowstorms. Now, you don't find them at all. You don't have to pick things out of the radiator of your car so it doesn't overheat. Uh, there was a butterfly, a beautiful butterfly in the east called the zebra swallowtail that used to occur in thousands in mountain valleys and so on. I collected butterflies in the east for more than 50 years and I caught one. So I've known for a long time, we've actually studied populations of insects right on Stanford campus and watched them disappear uh, as a result of climate change, of one of the big factors as well as lots of others. And as some of you know, the monarch butterfly, which you're looking at now, uh, is declining very rapidly everywhere. And these are, you can think of them as the canaries in the coal mine. We're losing biodiversity. People don't know really exactly what biodiversity is, but the important thing is that it supports our lives. The most obvious thing, for example, is pollination, where you probably read about the problems with honeybees and so on. But what we haven't read about very much is the fact that many, many native pollinators have gone extinct. Their populations have disappeared, which would, which is what makes us so dependent on things like honeybees. So it's a grim situation. It's part of a general grim situation of existential threats like climate disruption, like the fact that we've poisoned the planet from end to end and are seeing sperm counts drop in human beings as one possible result and so on. Uh, we're not paying enough attention. We're certainly not paying enough attention to climate disruption, which is one of the main things that's helping to wipe out the insects uh, and is going to help wipe out our civilization if we don't pay a lot of attention. So uh, what can I tell you? <laughs> it's, it's really cheery news. If you like fermented <laughs> grape juice, consuming it uh, will make the whole situation seem much, much pleasanter. <laughs> okay, well, I, I might have to do that after this. Uh, my next question was going to be, uh, I know sometimes when these big studies come out, you know, there'll be a write-up in the New York Times or the Guardian, and uh, people in the media who don't have scientific training can sometimes either interpret them inaccurately or go too far. Um, I'm assuming at this point you're, you're thinking that the media is not necessarily going too far in assuming that 
reporting, for instance, that we're losing 2.5% of insect biomass per year is, is actually as scary as it initially sounds? Well, that, that's, those are good data. In other mm -hmm. words, people have actually done studies, two, whether it's 2.7, 3.4, and so on is a different issue. Uh, but the media have, uh, I think, been too tamed. And I think it's because scientists have been too tamed. Um, a very famous climate scientist said there's a problem with scientific reticence. The scientific community is scared out of its mind. It has presented several times uh, statements about the future of humanity saying we're in great trouble from overpopulation, overconsumption and not paying attention to the existential threats that civilization is facing. And that has not gotten the coverage that it should have gotten. And most scientists tend to say, well, if we just, for example, we can feed more people if we don't waste so much food. Well, we're adding huge numbers of people to the population all the time. We've been talking about not wasting food since the 1950s. Uh, and yet we now waste more food uh, now than we did in the 1950s. Uh, so uh, the things that we have to do really will involve changing our lifestyles very dramatically. And frankly, I don't see any big sign of it. Well, that, that's actually where I'd like to turn to now. So uh, for people watching this video, so on the individual level, but also at the government level, um, what do you think could be done to, in, in a sort of reasonable fashion, deal with the, the, the threats that we face at this point? Well, talking about reasonable with the present government, as you just saw in your mm -hmm. last segment, <laughs> uh, is a sort of silly thing. But in fact, climate disruption is a national emergency, is a thing that is going to wreck our economy, wreck our country, wreck the world, if we don't start right now doing really dramatic things about it. We've wasted 20 or 30 years uh, while the scientific community has been warning of just talking about it and not doing anything really effective. Yes, we have a little more uh, renewable energy. Uh, yes, we are driving more electric cars, although the big problem is just too damn many people and too damn many cars. Uh, <laughs> but we're not uh, really declaring an emergency. And the existential threats to humanity are a genuine emergency. They're not a fake emergency like the current one. Uh, and they are not recognized by either our government or uh, to the large degree the media. When was the last time you heard somebody say that the problem with the disappearance of insects and the huge fires in California, New Zealand and, uh, and uh, Tasmania right now are caused fundamentally by too many people and too many rich people and middle class people consuming too much? You don't get that. You get that it's climate change, but you don't are not told that uh, about 35% of the greenhouse gases that go into the atmosphere come from the food system. Mm -hmm. The more people you have, the more you're going to have to try and grow more food, the more problems you're going to have with the insect disappearance. Uh, I'm really trying to be cheerful for you. What can <laughs> I, I can tell? tell. I can tell. <laughs> That's okay. On Mondays, we always start scary. We try to end with a little bit of optimism on Fridays, but we're not there yet. <laughs> okay. uh, so I guess my last question for you then is, um, in these issues, the, the big environmental issues with climate change being probably the single largest, I, I feel, maybe I'm in a bubble, but I feel like back 15 years ago with an inconvenient truth, people started to talk about it a little bit and then it died off and people stopped caring as much. Do you feel like now with talk of a Green New Deal at the national level, these you know extreme weather events, you know, usually producing at least a little bit of conversation around climate change, do you think that we might have a window where people are ready to take this, this stuff seriously for once? I pray we have a little window, but I can't be super, uh, I can't be super optimistic about it. The basic issue in our country is follow the money. As long as people are making huge amounts of money, the very, very rich want to see us continue doing the things that they do, the, the famous uh, system of taking from the poor and giving to the rich, uh, the uh, Hood Robin system that we've adopted. <laughs> if you can't change that, uh, if you can't stop the politicians from saying we'll solve it with growth, and the economist saying we'll solve it with growth when growth is the disease. I can't be optimistic, but again, there's always the fermented grape juice. There you go. Uh, so for everyone watching the show, at least we have that. <laughs> uh, Paul Ehrlich, thank you uh, for joining us on the show. I really appreciate your perspective. My great pleasure, thank you. We're gonna take uh, one more break. We come back, a little bit more news to cover after this. 
You might have noticed while listening to the president speak that both in his word choice, the way he expresses himself, there's an undercurrent of him being really, really, really dumb. And now we've got the science to back it up because scientists at University of Texas and Princeton have done an analysis of Donald Trump's speeches as well as the speeches of thousands of other politicians, individuals, presidents as well. And they can tell us a lot about Donald Trump, but there is some bad news here. And we will get to that in just a second. But first of all, they use a computer program to study nearly 3 million texts going back a couple hundred years actually. And they were able to rate speech, especially amongst presidents on a couple of different axes, including sort of competence and analytical thinking as well as confidence. So on that analytical thinking, Trump averaged a 44 on a one to 100 scale. The average presidential score is 90, actually. So he's at a 44, the average president is at a 90 out of 100. And that's actually, you'll be shocked to find out, the lowest. The bad news is though, you know who's second lowest? I know. You know, because you do your research. Most people, <laughs> well, <I read> it. <laughs> it's Barack Obama. Isn't that crazy? Now, yeah, granted, was, he's at a 69, uh -huh. nice. But that's a lot higher than a 44. There is the lowest. I don't know. That might have been down there the whole time. I don't even know. Anyway, so the most recent two presidents are the two lowest. And so the scary thing, and we'll get back to mocking Donald Trump in just a minute. The scary thing is, apparently over time, it has been trending down. Not just you know among people like George W. Bush and Donald Trump, but amongst Democrats or educated Democrats as well. And so the thing is, like. Sure, we get rid of Donald Trump, maybe, maybe we'll be spoken to like we're adults again, mm -hmm. but maybe things will just continue to trend down. And I think that's worrisome. Um, however, there is good news for the president. While he was low on uh, analytical thinking, his speeches, debates, and documents scored the highest amongst presidents on a scale that tries to measure confidence in language. So, not really all that shocking. Uh, it's, I guess it's like the Dunning-Kruger effect in action. By the way, Dr. Dunning will be on our show. The idea that people who are ignorant are ignorant of how ignorant they are about things. Okay. And overrate their, their capacity or capability in an area because they don't have the expertise to even know how much you should have. So he's really dumb and really confident. And thus, is he not the perfect American president? He represents us all on a fundamental level. Oh, relax. Okay. <laughs> I'm worried about us. Okay, so what, what did you think about these results? Um, you know, I, I know I, this always happens to me when it's something that like I don't want to offend. Mm -hmm. But I don't. You don't want to offend who? Like the the writer, the creators of this study. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It just. It's, that's my alma mater right there. Okay. So don't, okay. No, I'm kidding. No, it's, so it looks well, great. well, if you have an issue with the the methods of it, let's let's talk it out. No, I, I don't know if I would say I have an issue with it, but it's just like. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Obama's second. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is how I don't know. I just. Oh, okay. you think that they were targeting Obama with this? No, study? I don't think anyone was being targeted. You think there was racial bias in this? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's not at possible. all what I'm saying. No, I'm joking, and I know. you're not saying that. But theoretically, if you are analyzing language and mm -hmm. you're scoring certain things as highly analytical and others as not, some as confident and others as not. There, there could be. I mean, we're joking, but right, that could yeah, yeah. exist, and not intentionally. That could be an accidental thing as well. I feel like you'd see this and be like, "Oh, you know what? We should, uh, we should go back and we did something wrong." I don't know. Maybe. It just kind of felt like that. I mean, I just want to briefly, just because you brought up a really interesting point, okay. but Alexandria Castillo Cortez was talking about the fact that like AI can have racial biases. These sorts of like seemingly racially objective online tests and things like that. They, if they're they're programmed by a person, they can have biases as well. The thing here is, I mean, we're talking about presidents, but I think this is overall a bigger issue of our society. I mean, everybody has looked at those like, see an eighth grade test from 1912 and nobody can answer any of the questions anymore. I think that this is another indication of that, that largely in terms of our ability to communicate, how much information we have to store in our brains rather than in digital devices, I think that is trending down. And I think that's gonna affect a lot of different areas. And you areas. think it's, it went down from, uh, like Bush to Obama? No, 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 no. Trump is an idiot. Let's not, <laughs> and Trump is not just part of a trend, Trump is a moron. But I do think overall, I think we read less. I think people are less interested in education and schooling and stuff like that. Yeah, I no? I'm not, I'm not, I don't like this. Okay, okay. Well, you don't have to like the study. The point is, <laughs> no, that's so Trump bad. is an idiot. I'm sorry. Anyway. Okay.
Okay, uh, thank you so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me, always. It's always good to have you on. Thank you, everybody who's watching. I have a question watched. for you, we ran out of time. Oh, oh, well, we see who's more inquisitive out of the two of us. <laughs> okay, we're gonna rate you on a scale. Anyway, thank you everybody watching, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>